Hello and welcome to Access Asia. Coming up in this edition, more than half of the population of Afghanistan is facing famine, according to the United Nations. With little to no food to feed their families, we take a look at how millions of Afghans are struggling to survive. And in Myanmar, the energy giant Total Energies has decided to pull out of the country and its gas project there. The French company said civil rights abuses and a lack of effective sanctions against the military junta have led them to call it quits. And it's full steam ahead for Indonesia's new capital. After the parliament gave the green light to the 30 billion euro project, the new yet to be built city has been given a name. And we begin in Afghanistan, where men, women, and children are increasingly in dire straits, turning to begging, offering up their young daughters in marriage, and even selling a kidney to be able to put food on the table. With most international aid cut since the Taliban came back to power, some 23 million people are facing famine. Olivia Salazar Winspear has more. Cold, hungry, and desperate to make some money. These children are trying to sell small items to motorists, prayer cards, incense, or umbrellas. Since the Taliban took over last year, hunger has driven many to hawking whatever they can get their hands on in the streets. Hamdullah is nine years old, his father works at City Hall, but like many public servants, he's not been paid in months. His son does what he can to help out. I have six siblings. I'm here to make money to buy bread for them. This winter, the threat of famine stalks more than half of the Afghan population. Unable to pay for bread, these women wait outside the bakery, hoping that a generous customer will give them some on their way out. The Taliban intimidate and threaten us because we're begging. They say a woman's place is at home, but without a job, how am I supposed to feed my children? Once she's out of public view and at her own home, the woman lifts up her blue niqab. She says she wears it while begging in the street out of shame. With no heating inside the house, taking care of her children is a daily struggle. That's all I've got today, these onions. Luckily, my neighbor gave me a bit of bread, too. She used to work as a farmer in the south of the country until her husband was killed by the Taliban when they came to power. She fled to Kabul in August. Having to beg to survive was something she'd never imagined she'd have to do. With the old government, we didn't have much, but we could get by. Now, since the Taliban aren't recognized by foreign powers, who's going to help us? Other mothers beg in the middle of traffic. And when the kindness of strangers is no longer an option, some Afghans are turning to commercial routes, that is, selling their organs in order to survive. A month ago, Ghulam Hazrat sold one of his kidneys for $2,300. I couldn't go out and beg for money. I was not able to beg. Then I decided to go to the hospital and sell my kidney so I could at least feed my children for some time. Ghulam also needs the money to repay funds he borrowed when he tried to flee the country after the Taliban took control. In this region, Herat, illegal organ harvesting has been on the rise for the last five years. Doctors at this hospital say they performed 85 kidney transplant operations in 2021. 99% of the donors selling kidneys are the people encountering economic problems. And only 1% of donors are the ones who donate their kidney to a family member if needed. This deepening crisis has pushed the Taliban to request international aid, calling on other countries to send supplies, regardless of their politics. We're saying that foreign countries should help us. And they should also free up our funds too. Afghan money that's currently frozen in the US. International aid is trickling through slowly. In Kabul, people queue for flour, oil and lentils provided by the World Food Programme. A recent UN resolution to address the situation should speed up the distribution of this humanitarian aid. But amid concerns that it, or profits from it, will fall into the hands of the Taliban, those resources are only guaranteed for a year. 
Now to Myanmar, where French energy giant Total Energies and its American partner Chevron have announced that they are pulling out of the country. For months, human rights groups have been putting pressure on multinationals to withdraw. And Total Energies finally noted that civil rights abuses by the ruling junta have led them to call it quits. Alison Sargent has this story. Pressure had been mounting since the military seized control of Myanmar last February. Now French company Total Energy and their American partner Chevron are withdrawing from the country, effective within the next six months. The situation in terms of human rights and more generally the rule of law, which have kept worsening in Myanmar since the coup of February 2021, has led us to reassess the situation and no longer allows Total Energy to make a sufficiently positive contribution in the country. Since taking power, Myanmar's military is believed to have killed more than 1,400 people and arrested thousands. Total and Chevron have operated the Adana gas field off Myanmar's southwest coast since 1992, alongside state-owned companies from Myanmar and Thailand. According to Human Rights Watch, natural gas projects are Myanmar's single largest source of foreign revenue, generating more than $1 billion every year. The rights group had been pressuring Total to stop its operations there. Total's welcome move reflects the importance of avoiding complicity in the Myanmar junta atrocities. The next step is to ensure that gas revenues don't continue to fund those atrocities. Total and Chevron are the latest foreign companies to withdraw from Myanmar in the wake of the coup. Shell Oil Company also acknowledged Friday that as of last year, it no longer holds exploration licenses in Myanmar. Total said the financial impact on the company would be minimal, with its operations in Myanmar accounting for less than 1% of its total earnings. Home to over 10 million people and the capital of Indonesia, the city of Jakarta is sinking. It is a victim of climate change and congestion. Well, in 2019, the government promised to move the capital to Kalimantan, the Indonesian part of Borneo. But the plans were postponed because of the pandemic. Now, having been greenlighted by Parliament, the Mammoth Project is moving ahead. This is Indonesia's future presidential palace, part of a planned relocation of the country's capital from Jakarta to the province of East Kalimantan on the island of Borneo, 2,000 kilometers away. The new capital will be called Nusantara, which means archipelago, and the Indonesian parliament has just approved the government relocation plan. Jakarta's 10 million people live in one of the world's fastest sinking cities, Overextraction of groundwater, flooding linked to climate change and infrastructure problems are creating serious difficulties. Experts predict about a third of the country could be underwater by 2050. Indonesia's president pushed for this change just before his re-election in 2019. He says he wants the new presidential palace to be ready before he ends his second term in 2024. The development of the new capital in East Kalimantan province has to become a move towards building cities that are healthy, efficient and productive, designed to be a place where people are close to any destination and where they can bike and walk everywhere because there are zero emissions. Nusantara will be the biggest ever infrastructure project in Indonesia. The cost is estimated to be almost 30 billion euros. Yet critics warn it could damage ecosystems in a region where mining and palm oil plantations already threaten rainforests, which are home to endangered species. Several groups representing the indigenous people of Borneo have also voiced their concerns about the future capital. Jellyfish may be the bane of every swimmer's dip in the sea, but in some countries they're also a gastronomic delicacy and have been for hundreds of years. Now with warming seawaters and overfishing, there are more jellyfish in our oceans than ever before. And in Thailand, this problem is being turned into an opportunity, with chefs serving up the low-fat, high-protein blobs in their latest dishes. And it's a food trend that could go global. This jellyfish caught in southern Thailand is edible. Hundreds appear on the ocean's surface when there is no underwater current. For these fishermen, they are a welcome catch. I don't know what's happening in the water below, but there's no more squid, prawns, shellfish. There's nothing. 
I earn between 25 and 50 euros a day with a jellyfish. With a traditional catch, I get just 10 euros a day. Jellyfish production in Thailand is on an industrial scale. This processing factory is turning out three tons per day, some of it for export. The company's annual turnover is in the millions of euros. Our clients mainly eat jellyfish as an appetizer. It's good for people's health. The main markets are Japan, South Korea, China and the United States. But in the U.S., only the Asian-American community. Some chefs in large Asian cities such as Bangkok are using jellyfish to prepare a variety of dishes. I can make jellyfish dumplings in green curry or a jellyfish salad or jellyfish spaghetti and pesto. Green curry brings out the taste of the jellyfish. There's a pleasant smell because there are so many spices in the curry. It makes the jellyfish delicious. Jellyfish dishes have their fans, as in this restaurant where this customer is savouring each morsel. It's excellent. The texture's a bit sticky, rubbery. I eat a lot of it. I love it. I order jellyfish pasta and even ask for an extra side order of jellyfish. Eating jellyfish could become a global habit. Scientists say the depletion of fish stocks and higher water temperatures will lead to more of them in our oceans, a situation exacerbated by the fact they themselves eat newly hatched fish. I, for one, would love to taste them as long as there's no sting involved. That does it for this edition of Access Asia. Thanks for being with us. Stay tuned for more news on France 24. One year ago, Storm Alex devastated 13 villages along the Roya Valley in France's Alpes Maritime Departement, destroying families as it went. Donc, coup, j'ai entendu tout craquer. Following the losses, disappearances and trauma of the disaster, the Col de Tenda region is now a shadow of its former self. An investigation into what remains of Roya in Revisited on France 24 and France24.com.